There are days, or there will be days, when each of us wonders, why am I here? Why was I born? We sometimes question, don't we, what our next steps will be or should be? Worrying about our purpose in life is especially heavy on our hearts during significant life changes. Graduating from school, losing a job, looking for a job, or when our significant other decides that we're not the one for them, or we're in the middle of a health crisis, or when we celebrate a milestone birthday. The truth is we tend to think we need to have it all together, and so about being on the right path, or we hope and, that, and pray that we are on the wrong, we, we worry about being on the wrong path, or we hope we, that we are on the right path. We tend to get tied up inside if we think we have missed the signs, the God signs. Early on in my ministry, I was drawn to the writings of Trappist monk Thomas Merton, and it was freeing to read works by a spirit who dealt with his authentic self rather than super, superficial platitudes. During one particular challenging week, this prayer showed up in my readings. It revived my hope that I need not worry or stress over which road I should take. Listen, I hope that it helps you. My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think that I'm following you, following your will, does not mean that I'm actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does, in fact, please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, will I put my trust in you always. Though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Our gospel this morning strikes me as a turning point in the followers of Jesus' discipleship training. Once Jesus' followers identify him as the Messiah, as you learned last week. Jesus then began to make it very clear what being a Messiah meant. Peter wasn't ready for Jesus' vision of Messiah. And after hearing that Jesus must go straight to the political hotspot and be confronted by the politicians, the religious leaders, and the religious lawyers, and then be killed... Peter pulls Jesus aside, perhaps yanks him aside, and pretty much gave Jesus a talking to. No way, Jesus, this cannot happen to you. This is not what you should do. This is wrong. Apparently, Peter thought he knew better than his rabbi. And by opposing Jesus, he shows us that he held a view of the Messiah that was common in those days. The Messiah in those days was thought to be the military conqueror, someone who would vanquish the Roman occupiers and restore the Davidic monarchy once and for all. The ancient title for Messiah was often given to a monarch, and yes, Jesus is king, but not the style of Caesar. Jesus, in fact, opposes the grasping forms of power. Jesus' mode of opposition isn't armed with a sword, rather just the opposite. Rather than having or grasping a domineering fist, Jesus utilizes an open, loving hand. 
And yes, Jesus will lead a revolution, but one of love, service, and justice. And although Jesus will experience cruelty, that is only on the surface. On the surface, he will suffer and be defeated, but with God's deeper physics, he will prevail. Even though Jesus assures them that he will rise again, Peter doesn't comprehend this. He hasn't even grasped what Jesus' movement is about, that Jesus' movement is about love, service, and justice. Jesus abruptly stops Peter with, get out of my way, Peter. Yes, he used stronger language than that. Get out of my way, Peter. You are way off the mark. In fact, you are in my way. And so he gathers his disciples together because more neat work needs to be done. They haven't understood his message. Friends, he says, you need to leave your old views behind. If you are on this journey with me, this mission, and you think it's a violent campaign, a movement of domination and conquest, well, you might as well turn around and go home. That's not what I'm about. We're not headed to Jerusalem to conquer the temple. We are headed to the cross. Followers of Jesus don't give in to the temptation to run from hard times. They don't shy away from resisting the status quo. Rather, followers of Jesus resist injustice, even if it's risky. I might say especially if it's risky, not in a violent sort of way. On the surface, everything seems to be driven by might and violence and grasping for power. We see that in the news. But underneath, there is a deeper physics. And this level of living is driven by love, humility, and generosity. But to live at this level, this deeper level, it will mean we will suffer. But the good news is, we will rise. Please take note that Jesus is not saying, go seek out the cross and then follow me, but rather he is saying, take up your cross and follow. This is not an invitation to pursue suffering. This is not a directive to make your life more difficult, because didn't Jesus say that we are called to love ourselves? as we love our neighbors, or love our neighbors as ourselves. We are called to take on the active role of activist, not the role of languishing victim. Now, this may not seem like good news, and you may be tempted to go looking for scripture that gives you an out, that will help you say that my life is supposed to have green pastures all the way every day. But the Romans 12 passage that has been the parallel passage for our lecture, lectionary readings this, this Sunday and last Sunday supports Jesus' message. Romans 12, and in this congregation we don't read all the lectionary uh, verses, I, maybe because we'd be here all day, I don't know, um, but, but many of my churches I've been at, we, we did read them all, but I would love for you to go looking for Romans 12 uh, in your Bible or on your phone and check this out. It's Paul's mini handbook for Jesus followers. It's a detailed reason why you and I are here. If you ever kind of wonder, why am I here? Open up Romans 12. It's our purpose, our calling. And Paul does not shy away from Jesus' directive. He actually fleshes it out. What does it mean to live as a sacrifice to God? It's how we are to be followers of Jesus. It's a list. There are about 30 statements in this scripture. And I, in your bulletin, if you have a bulletin, you're free to write. There's only five lines there, but, you know, 
take whatever five seems to pop out to you and write them down. I believe it's going to be on the screen too. So the first is, let love be genuine. If you need to compete, anybody out there competitive? Oh, come on. I saw one hand besides mine. OK, good. Oh, more. OK, if you need to compete, compete only in showing honor to one another. Sound good? That has you thinking about other people, not yourself. I like this one. Practice rejoicing in hope. Has anyone heard a complaint this morning? Right? Um, I was told just recently that complaining becomes a habit. Maybe even you are addicted to complaining. Hope can become a habit. And so my prayer is that all of us will really work at this one, me included, work at rejoicing in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Oh, this is a good one coming up here. Work at making strangers feel welcome and at home among you. Bless your enemies. Don't curse them under your breath. That's the person on the road that you're driving who zooms past you and cuts you off. That's someone on the news that you're not so happy about their ideology. Don't curse them under your breath. Love them. Bless them. If your enemy is hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. Did you get at least five in there that you would like to write down? I would encourage you to do that. I'm going to ask Ryan to leave that on the screen a little longer. The Apostle Paul, the writer of this passage, sounds like he understands Jesus' teaching. He's passed it on to the Roman church centuries ago, and today it is passed on to us. As the Thomas Burton prayer says, we may not know if we are choosing the right job or making those day-to-day -day choices correctly, but as a follower of Jesus, there are deeper choices that matter the most. We are called to love, to make peace, to be full of patience, to persevere, to be compassionate, even with our annoying neighbor, our enemy. This is not always easy, we know that, but through God's grace, we will be transformed. As we nurture our relationship with Jesus, we will be enabled to carry out our calling. Friends, Let's not get in the way of God's kingdom coming to earth. We don't want Jesus saying that to us, right? Get out of my way. No, rather let's do our part to follow Jesus and work alongside Jesus in fulfilling this mission of love, service, and justice. Amen.